first question? How do you ensure the academic rigor and consistency in the ACE review process? And I think let's let's start off with detail on that one. Okay, good afternoon everyone. If you don't mind, I'd like to make this somewhat of an informal process so that we all feel comfortable asking questions and sharing information in terms of the ACE review process. I've served as a faculty evaluator over the last several years, and it's been my experience that it's, I always learn something new. But in the process of evaluating course content related to any particular curriculum, normally there is a team of professionals or subject matter experts that, that participate in the review process. And a lot of the, the items we review, uh, I specifically have flown, flown to uh, Fort Sam Houston, Texas, which was mentioned in our last session. Um, do you mind if I kind of walk around a little bit? I'm a chair as an administrator, but I'm also uh, a faculty member, so I'm used to teaching and talking to students and kind of walking around. But ultimately, what we are tasked to do is review the content of each course that a military service member may take. And so I've flown to Fort Sam Houston several times. And Fort Sam Houston is where they actually train any military service member that is interested in pursuing a healthcare profession. And as was mentioned in our prior um, grand meeting uh, next door, normally, in most cases, there is a civilian counterpart to the military occupation. With that being said, my experience at Fort Sam Houston has been very enlightening. Um, I've traveled there and I've re reviewed the course content, I've seen the trainings that occur, I've been to uh, places where they actually learn to put up um, specific units and labs, specifically when they're in Afghanistan or Iraq or places where they may not have the brick and mortar that's required that we would like to, them to have. Um, and they're trained in their special fields of um, their health professions. And so looking at the level of rigor is the question here. Um, how do you assure academic rigor and consistency? That occurs because the team is normally uh, consistent of subject matter experts of faculty members from around the nation. There's normally maybe 12 of us on average that come together in nursing, my background is in public health, and so there is a prevent, preventive med, normally occupation associated with the military. Uh, we have um, physician assistants or, or other faculty members that train students in those particular professions. So we are definitely aware of the curriculum that's required to be successful in those fields. And many times, there's a pass-fail when you talk about military training. There is not an opportunity to take retake courses there's not an opportunity to earn a certain grade lower than what's expected for military. So um, I got involved as a faculty evaluator because my brother's currently serving as a lieutenant colonel in the Army. My father's retired from the military. And so and I grew up in the military environment in Germany most of my um, childhood. And so along with looking at assessments, looking at test materials, looking at textbooks, and a lot of that other information, we consider Bloom's taxonomy, which addresses what type of learning is actually occurring. Are they just recalling information that they learned in a textbook, or are they actually taking it another step and actually learning how to apply their knowledge? We look at and consider all of that information. We also look at the timeline in which they are receiving their training. And so there's a lot that goes into it in terms of the role of a faculty evaluator. And sometimes we do not have consensus. We do not always agree in terms of what level. And um, if you get an opportunity to look at the military guide, and it sounds like you will be doing that in the spring, you will be able to identify how we, as faculty evaluators, determine whether a course should be granted at the lower or the upper level. And you know what I'm referring to when I make reference to that. And so that's where the degree of rigor and consistency comes from. Um, and that's basically pretty much it. We'll get a little bit more in depth in terms of what some of the other items are that we review as faculty evaluators in the next two questions that come up. Thanks, Tara. And we, we will also have an exhibit for you at the end to show you an example of uh, 
this type of evaluation. Uh, Tim, would you like to comment on the same question? Uh, I agree with Tara. One thing I think I'd like to reinforce is the idea that there are uh, on reviews, out on a site review, there are always multiple faculty. So no single faculty evaluator is working alone, working independently. Uh, they're working with peer, other peer faculty uh, select from other types of institutions across the country to add a, a general perspective of curriculum and a general perspective of uh, higher ed content coverage scope of, part, of a particular subject area. So they work in collaboration on site, reviewing material, getting at that rig rigor uh, aspect of each course that they recommend for credit. Okay, Mayor Beth. And I'd like to stand up too, because I used to work in early childhood, so I, you always have to run around with kids, right, make sure they're paying attention. <laughs> but I, when we were talking about what assures rigor, I'm really thinking about the whole process from the beginning when the teams are picked and how they are picked. I mean, the fact that they're subject matter experts, but they're also, a lot of them are experts in assessment, and they sit on the credit box, and the reviewers add their comments to what goes on in the exhibit. And we, not me personally, but ACE has been doing this review for more than 60 years. And just recently, we had, we put together an external academic review for this course it was made up of nine members, three of whom belong to accrediting bodies, one regional, one <coughs> professional, and another technical, as well as faculty um, and um, provost and so forth. So they really looked at that review process and we're putting that into place so that that happens. We have a review of our review every three years. So and the findings are public, and I'm happy to share that so you can see that, but it gives um, us an idea of what an external reviewer thinks we're doing well and what, what else we need to do. So in terms of putting the faculty teams together and, and having a rigorous review process, we've got that. In terms of things we can review, there's more we can do in terms of evaluating and training our own faculty in a formal fashion, and there are more formal rubrics that we can put into place for all faculty as far as helping them uh, look at criteria for rigor, uh, scope, and content and assessment. I just would like, I'd like to add one more thing. If I had not mentioned it before, as faculty evaluators, we also consider learning outcomes and objectives and making sure those courses are in alignment with not only how we want to produce our students at the end of the day, but making sure if the program has a national accreditation associated with it, that the program objectives and learning outcomes are in alignment with the national standards as well. So all of that is taken into consideration when we determine and assess rigor and consistency. And again, the faculty come nationwide when we all get together and, so, and are selected as teams. So um, we've kind of set the stage. This is the process. And our uh, panel thought that the best way to proceed is, uh, you know, since these questions are so broad, uh, if you have any questions right now on this, these, uh, this first question, um, please raise your hand. Let me know. Yes. Uh, you were on a panel and you, you might have a disagreement about the credit that should be offered or assigned to something. Is it um, a consensus model? Is there a majority? I mean, I imagine it might vary from A to B, but I don't know if there's a consistency in that part of the process. Excellent question. <laughs> um, it's a consensus pretty much, and, and then at the end of the day, majority rule, <laughs> to be honest with you. But there's a, a huge amount of dialogue that does occur when, when there is not consist, consensus at first. And so in that dialogue, again, we learn more about the expectations of whatever the profession may be. And, and I've learned based on um, an invitation to, to do something seminar, sem seminar similar to this around the country is that if there's not consensus, okay, we understand that, but is there someone on the team that has a, a legitimate and valid reason why there may not be consensus? And it may be related to industry standards. 
It may be related to a certain change. For example, health informatics did not exist 10, 20, 30 years ago, but it exists now. And so there's always a change. There's a, tr a change in the trends that occur that are associated with each industry standard. So that contributes sometimes. So are that dissenting opinion, if you will, caused in any way or then uh, rolled into the next round of evaluation? Potentially, potentially. Now, um, Ms. Lakin can, can, pr can pretty much address how often the evaluations occur per course, per profession, per discipline. But I'm just sharing my particular experience as a faculty evaluator and, and the reasons why. Do you want to speak to how often, maybe? Is that your question? Yes, and is there any conversation between the previous team or is there some type of document? That there is. They're looking to say, okay, well, now this might evolve just in the last few years. Absolutely. That information is available in the military guide. We can actually see the date and the year the last evaluation was done, done on a particular course. And so that, Helps. And we don't look at it initially. We go in, we do our job, and then we're able to look back after we've come to a consensus on what, how the credits were awarded previously. And then you had conversations with other teams because it seemed to me that there was some overlap. Um, obviously, all the medical professions, public health, are going to have some other overlap, especially where there's a lot of folks from. Is there ever time to find something like, well, it doesn't quite fit in here, but. Right. Actually, we have not had that opportunity to have a conversation or a dialogue with another team. Normally, we're there for a specif specified amount of time as that particular team for that period. So that's a good question, though. Thank you. Any other questions? OK. And typically, and again, it's going to depend on the service, but typically every five years, it's going to depend on also the occupation and the training. And to be honest, there are some service branches, and I will not name names, that are kind of behind on things and trying to, you know, there's a variety of reasons. They're doing other things besides training and plus their budget issues and federal government and all that. But um, the other thing that I think speaks to your question that Tara uh, mentioned is that there are reviewer notes. And so they will they will address some of the some of the issues that you talked about when there's something emerging or there are trends changing. So one of the things we're looking at now, the ACE team uh, team at at NBC is looking at how how might we share those reviewer notes? How might they inform faculty and institutions? So what format do we do we put them in? So, yeah. On the consensus process. Uh, Team members on an ACE team may have discussions, may have perspectives on what they're finding, uh, and they may or may not be based on complete information. So in a review process, the organization usually has uh, knowledgeable curriculum-related specialists, content-related specialists, maybe instructors or trainers available to, uh, to speak to, and so sometimes the in order to come to a consensus process, additional information, clarity needs to be had, and uh, the, and hopefully, in an ideal review, the, the available individuals are uh, um, accessible on site to be able to ask questions, seek clarification, to be able to uh, to uh, to be able to break a tie, essentially, so to speak. I think the idea of teams talking to each other is great. Yeah. So if there's a Yeah, I think this uh, second question helps us uh, drill down a little further and really uh, follows up on the question that was asked. Uh, what factors uh, do you take into consideration your decision for credit uh, and or no credit recommendations? Given the variability of uh, credit hours and academic levels, different academic uh, levels across the institutions. Tim, let's start with you. Yeah, so we were thinking about this and uh, you know we know if you look enough long enough through the national guide and you look at a sampling of credit recommendations you'll find various examples of everything from one semester credit recommended to three or more semester credits recommended um, how do we come up with those kinds of variabilities in a particular review uh, to us it all pretty much focuses on the content that we're looking at while we're on site 
Uh, on site, we are looking at everything related to an instructional program, a training program uh, that that you normally have on your own campuses if you're looking at what's being taught. But we're focusing on learning outcomes. We're focusing on instructional uh, strategies that are used in a training environment. We're looking at uh, the the uh, when a, upon successful completion of the students. Uh, performance in whatever the training activity or instructional program is, what are those areas of knowledge and skills and abilities that they'll be able to demonstrate uh, at the end of that program? <clears throat> and then ultimately, how do those compare to a curriculum on a college, in a, in a college campus? Uh, for training courses, we're looking at all aspects of instructional materials. Nothing's out of bounds. We're looking at instructor guides, instructor notes, what happens each hour, each day, each week of, of, a, of an instructional model uh, to look at the level of depth and scope and, and, and rigor associated with a particular uh, scope of coverage, not just the content, but how the content's covered. Um, in an occupational specialty review, we're looking at analyzing jobs and tasks and what students are able to know, what, student, what, what individuals have to know and be able to do in order to perform their roles and how are those skills, knowledge, abilities kind of equated to a college course curricula that we find on college campuses. <clears throat> uh, we're, uh, we're looking at, uh, it, as we're analyzing all of the training and all of the instructional materials, we're looking at carving out what are the major topics covered in the particular course. Just kind of like when you're carving out a particular course in a sequence for a three semester credit course on campus for about a 15 week period of instruction, what are those areas of major topics that need to be covered for that course? We're looking to pull out of the training environment what are the major topics and themes that are addressed in the particular course. The, the uh, decision point isn't so much based on time. Uh, sometimes that uh, sometimes that's, uh, takes some work to get uh, new, new faculty around. And sometimes organizations want to say, well, our, our employees, our staff, our military are spending so much time on training in this particular area, but that doesn't equate directly to a decision on credit on, it, on its own. Um, <clears throat> I say one of the biggest keys that most of us would reference is uh, not so much what's covered, uh, how it's covered, but really, as you can probably predict, how it's assessed. Because assessment is the key in, in, in an evaluation process. We're looking for the organization to demonstrate how the individual students are assessed and for what you're expecting them to be able to learn. Uh, I think the other thing that we're looking at is that related to the content, faculty evaluators are constantly in the back of their mind. You're, you're probably all familiar with the credit recommendation in terms of its credit, in terms of its level. But then the other theme that the, other theme that the faculty on a team are charged with is to identify uh, to what academic discipline the, the credit is recommended uh, to be to equate to. In other words, what's the alignment with a credit uh, content equivalency on our, on our own campuses? Uh, sometimes that's related to what the content and major topics are covered, but more and more it's related to what's assessed. Because we find periodically that training programs cover a lot of content, but the assessment and performance expectations is related to a particular narrow focus. And sometimes uh, instruction training that covers a lot of time might equate to a small number of credits based on what's assessed. Thought I'd mention just what are some of the what are the, some of the common reasons? It's pretty. Uh, I mean, we usually work through a process where uh, more than not there's a credit recommendation for uh, training activities. But uh, what are the common patterns that we see that uh, result in a no credit recommendation? Uh, those are those are often based on the faculty judgment uh, identifying uh, content of instruction being too narrow or too mission focused, uh, and not just just not equating to a college level content uh, in any way. Uh, the second primary area that we find it, uh, result the result of a no credit recommendation is there's a lot of content coverage but very little assessment. So it's hard to identify whether a student that's participated in an activity actually individually performed the knowledge, skill, and ability that you'd expect them to have. Uh, so some, so I, I think in my personal view, those two, uh, the, the content being so narrowly focused, it doesn't equate to what we find on our own curriculum and it can't be aligned. 
And secondly, it's just a, a, it, it's a weak assessment component in the process. Thank you, Tim. Yeah. I completely agree with what Tim has said. I just want you to keep in mind that as faculty evaluators, we are definitely aware that, and I know this is a difficult session. We just ate lunch and I'm looking around. Everyone with us? <laughs> I realize this is difficult, but hang in there. Um, one of the things that we consider is that our service members are training to mission. They're not specifically training for a degree at the time. And so with that train to mission, their goal is to, as was mentioned earlier, for example, for a physician assistant or a hospital corpsman, to take care of prevention, to do environmental health inspections, to make sure their service members remain healthy and they're able to function as the soldiers we need them to out wherever they may be. And so training to mission is something we're definitely cognizant of. As Tim also mentioned, um, one of the things I consider because my background is in the health professions is, do they have a lab as a part of their training? Are they actually in a lab, dissecting whatever? Are they doing these things that will help to enhance the knowledge that they're already learning in the lecture part of it? Because as many of you know, human anatomy, microbiology, courses like that require not only the content or the lecture aspect of it, but it also requires lab work. So we consider things like that as well. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, so. So let's move on and let them ask questions. So are there any, any questions out there about what's considered as far as the credit recommendations and no credit recommendations? Yes. Um, speaking uh, on the point that you were just making about that, when we talk about it, yes. <laughs> um, regarding healthcare especially, a lot of our majors, thanks. A lot of our majors require um, accreditation issues from you know the larger uh, career field, and so many of our departments are a little hesitant that the student may not be prepared to pass those licensure exams, that they may not be prepared for that next level if it's graduate school, like physical therapy, or um, as a healthcare professional, how do you see that this um, review process takes that into? consideration. As a reminder, I'm from Columbus, Georgia. And you guys are doing a phenomenal job by communicating. I think communication is the key. And as someone mentioned in the earlier session, um, making sure that, and I don't even know if the gentleman is here, but he mentioned that he contacted Fort Sam Houston, Texas, and found out that their LPN program it's pretty much they have a, a, an agreement with this particular state. So any LPN that's certified in that state can easily maintain their license in this state. I'm not sure if Georgia is having that conversation or not. Don't quote me. I, I honestly admit I'm not sure. But that's the first step, communication. Um, my nursing faculty, I contacted two of my colleagues at different universities prior to this session just asking them, and I contacted my registrar, just asking them, what do you do about nursing? Because I know nursing in particular, they want to have very high pass rates when it comes to the NCLEX, the national success, and they want to brag on that. That's one of the recruiting mechanisms to get students enrolled in their program. But also just making sure, again, that we are setting these students up for success if they are veterans. We don't want to set them up for failure by providing them with credit that it eventually may not be to the end, may not work in their favor, in other words. But I was told that courses like maybe a pharmacology course, that may be a course that they may be willing to accept. But other courses that require clinical hours, they may not as they may not be willing to accept courses like that. And so does that answer your question? It, it does. I mean that's Communication, I think, is really going to be the key and contacting places like Fort Sam Houston because as faculty evaluators, we can ask the instructors questions that pertain to the content, that pertain to the curriculum. That's really, really important. If we can get confirmation of, about what they're learning and how they're training and making sure that if we do accept credits, that it's setting the student up for success or, and you know, one of my, uh, the deans of the School of Nursing of one of the universities that I, universities I contacted actually bragged on the veterans 
and said they do better than the regular non or the traditional students because they already have the expertise, the experience. So, but are they willing to grant them credit? Not so much, and that's unfortunate. Another question. This is going in a slightly different direction. So it's a very comprehensive, thorough process to evaluate the credit. And you share the process with colleagues. I'm certain, though, once this is, despite the transparency, that there will be some skeptical colleagues. So uh, can you talk a bit about how you uh, win over skeptical colleagues? Well, I'll, I'll start with that because we have what we, and where is Patty? Patty Brewer is one of them, but we started what we call regional liaisons that are, are across the country and who have been, who are faculty, who have been uh, reviewers on the review teams, and they know the, re, the review part, but they know the application part too. They know some of the complexities of aligning and mapping and articulating as well as the review process itself. So we try to, we feel like faculty are, we're like everybody else, we learn by doing. So we simulate a lot of things in turn. We put, we do uh, what we call a review in the box. We also do actual uh, mapping sessions where you bring your curriculum, your laptop, and the course exhibits, you sit down, you map, you say, okay, this aligns, this doesn't, I need more information, I've got a question here. Um, we bring different faculty from different institutions who say, this is how I set up my mapping process. And the other thing that Paul and I have talked a lot about in terms of learning by doing is, we've just got to have more faculty from Ohio on our faculty teams. And that's why we did this flyer and brought it out to you so you can see, here are the qualifications, here are the areas that, that we need. So, you know, you're gonna have these faculty panels try to figure out how things map. Well, a lot of those folks on the faculty panels need to be on our ACE review teams, understand the process, and, and then come back and be able to talk to others about the process. So that's, that's part of what we do. I think the one, the one, one thing I'd comment on and that is that every one of our institutions has an expectation of program outcomes assessment, right? We're all looking at how are our programs going in terms of our outcome assessment programs, whatever that means to existing programs. And these are individual students that are coming in and applying these credits to specific degree programs and from that point forward they're performing at the levels they're performing at. So looking at internal assessments and looking at how a segment of a student population that receives some credit through prior learning assessment, some credit, credit through military training, uh, some credit through transfer from other institutions, and see how they're performing in, in their own degree programs. Once they get inserted into the mix, they're one of the many students that are on campus. I can add one more. I have actually spoken to the chair assembly about the importance of I, I feel like I'm kind of an informal champion for ACE. <laughs> I've actually spoken to the chair assembly and other bodies or groups within my campus to explain to them how the process works, the role of an evaluator, and how important it is to consider what our veterans have done and the training they receive and, and why they should at least consider it. And so I think that helps a lot. Having a champion on your campuses that really understands the process is really important. Okay, thank you. Um, let's move on to the third question, okay? Um, and this has to do with a question that came from the audience. Uh, how would you recommend other faculty uh, the use of credit recommendations that your panel developed and why? Right, Beth? Why don't we throw up the, the, Let's do the exhibit. course exhibit, yeah. So, um, so we recommend um, that, that you use our credit recommendations just in the way that you're beginning to use them. So you're thinking about, um, you're, you're looking at the training, you're looking at the occupations, you're looking at policies and practices, and you're figuring out how do you align them through all, all your different tag categories, right? And so one of the things that we want you to do with them is 
once you've understand, understood the review process itself and, and you feel comfortable about that, and you're looking at the credit recommendation, and remember, the credit recommendation with the exhibit is something that the faculty have put together, so they have to be comfortable and confident with, with what's on, on that exhibit. So what we need from you, and this is what I mentioned to Jared on my soapbox in another, <laughs> in another session is, we want feedback. So you need enough information to make the judgment so it doesn't, it doesn't take you forever to make the judgment. You feel like you have enough information and it's not torturous and painful in getting to that place. So what we want and need from you is a review of the credit recommendation itself and feedback on that. What does it tell you? How does it help you align with your curriculum? What else do you, you need? And, and we'll pay attention to that. We, for those of you who've worked with us over the years, you know that we're gonna try to make some, some changes. So that's, that's one thing I personally wanted, and I think others uh, in, in work, doing this work want that as well, is that, is that feedback. To review it, look at it, study it, tell us how it works and doesn't work for you. Yeah. Just the example that's up on the screen, if you look at a, 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 tra a transcript, if you look at a record that tends to be coming through about, a, about an individual student, you often see the title of a program, you see the course description, you see credit recommendations. But from the perspective of the faculty that are on review teams, sometimes the credit recommendations be the hard part is actually describing what the content of the credit recommendation is. And just in this particular case, you'll see this particular uh, uh, job category has a component of three semester credits and human resource methods. If you just look at that, it's really hard for a campus to figure out what does that mean. But if you go down and drill into the learn, uh, course display, into the, into the detail of the course, you'll start to see that the human resource has an objective that's written like a course description. That might not tell you much more information, but now you're looking at learning outcomes. At the end of this particular program, the student will be able to apply contemporary human resource concepts, practices, techniques, theories. Wasn't, you know, we're not looking at this as a particular classic perfect example. Uh, the point that we wanted to make is that the team members prepare this language so that it, it can be interpreted the best we can possibly do by colleges and universities all across the country when making decisions about how to apply the credit to a degree program. So team members actually spend time while they're on site thinking about how the course display is going to be interpreted by colleges and universities around the country. We're addressing what language do we want to say it is important in the learning outcome statements and what methods of instruction are used in the instructional materials because sometimes to individuals on campus that might matter. If it's a health-based program, it's you know, the difference between kind of a clinical activity as opposed to a theoretic and conceptual framework. Uh, and then ultimately how the assessment methods are, are deployed for the particular learning activity to make sure that the individual students have demonstrated that they know what they claim that they know. So right, that's, that's what we want to emphasize. That's basically it. Within this document, um, and again, I relate it a lot to healthcare, but within this document, you it actually drills down into aspects of leadership because this is a this particular one is a captain, captain's career course, but there is also information about leadership skills. You obviously have to have leadership skills in a lot of the roles in the military. And so consideration for credit, and this is credit that actually can appear in the, uh, the the meaty part of whatever degree plan, not in the electives. And that's where, unfortunately, a lot of the courses end up. I think it was mentioned earlier in one of the grand sessions, apparently and obviously, they're gonna get credit for physical education. But have you considered maybe granting them credit for something that, again, is in, um, I don't know how Ohio does it, but we have specific program required courses. Have you considered courses specifically for those areas is really important. So for example, those hospital corpsmen, nurses, what have you, they should get credit in the meteor part of the curriculum for CPR, first aid, again, human anatomy, microbiology, pharmacology. Those are courses that are relevant to the occupation and they should be applied not as a general elective, but as part of the, the meteor part of the curriculum. And again, 
I just have my own my own personal perspective of where they should be applied because I'm familiar with just because of my role as a faculty evaluator, I'm familiar with the training that actually occurs and how they not only learn it, but they apply it every day to save lives, and that's important. Okay, we have a question. I understand if this is a course or some form of STEM class. So this might not be a good example of what you did. But one of the things the Higher Learning Commission has always asked me about is we have to do that for our faculty to teach class. So on these kinds of ACE evaluations, is there some area where the individual is, you know, what you have to know if you're people like lots of leaders, like faculty groups, is there some way that It's not part of the recommendation itself, um, and so it wouldn't be something that you would find. It would be something that when we do the review on the corporate and the military side, we do find out what the instructor qualifications are. But remember, we're not, we're looking at extra institutional learning. We're not looking at uh, learning from an originally accredited institution. So we are recognizing not only the credentials that they might have, but the experience and how they're ranked and rated, whether it's military or corporate. But I guess part of the, what you can refer to as the meteor kind of thing. You know, this research, too many research meetings about the DE, a kind of a class that maybe wouldn't be front and center, beyond physical, physical education, and logistics. You know, to move beyond that into these types of programming that some sort of Let me just take a stab because I agree with Mary Beth. Uh, it's not directly part, but it is a component of all across all ACE review process, both military and corporate agency side. Who's involved is a component of what's covered. Um, so here's, I mean, I can think of cases where even fields have shifted over time. I'm not sure if healthcare and nursing is one of those. I, mean, I know, I know uh, uh, fire science evolved over time, but um, but if it we're getting down to a specific training, sometimes the, uh, the review is looking at who are the instructors, who are the trainers, who, and what are their backgrounds, and what do they bring to the table. And sometimes it's not about their degree credentials like it might be HLC, but if it's coming from their practical, they come from a practical standpoint, they may be providing good training, but they may not provide the conceptual framework that you'd get if you came from a graduate level background. And, uh, and that may become then a component for the level or the, or the credit recommendation of the, of the uh, activity. So it is a component of it, but it's not necessarily a direct yes or no, because the, the, you know, what the students are demonstrating is the ability to do or no is the key to the process. I would say you're, it's a very similar category to general prior learning assessment. Did I learn something on my own, or did I learn it some, by somebody with, supported by somebody with degrees? Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Bring the microphone back. Um, my question is, 
the, the information that's on the screen right now, does that represent the highest level of detail in terms of the information that's provided you know, about what was taught in the course? And the reason why I'm asking is because some of our departments are, are, are very picky about what they give credit for, and this isn't a military credit thing. It could be coming from a four-year school, and they can be picky about what kind of things they give credit for. So they want to think, see things like you know something akin to a seven or an eight page syllabus, of which you might have maybe a page or even two pages. A few pages might be a bit much, but you know a page or something that are dedicated to things like objectives and learning outcomes and, and how the assessments are split up and so on. So it, you know if you're trying to if you're putting something in front of a department, and particularly if they're reticent, they might not even be willing to admit to any bias about military credit. But if you can only give them you know, a couple of paragraphs on winning outcomes and objectives, it's easier for them to say no. And I'm actually thinking, you know, more in the case of this could be the difference between an elective credit in a major and credit for a core course in a major. You know, which is a, you know, there's a very specific course that everybody has to do, and if they're not absolutely sure that it's, that it's, that it's really close to that particular course, then they'll just say no. And, you know, maybe they'll give elective credit for it. In the worst case scenario, you're, you're saying no credit versus elective credit. So I'm wondering, is there another level of detail beyond this that we can call on somewhere that we can point to? Well, this, this right now, um, and there, there are pages and pages of this, different topics for this one particular training. This is a mock exhibit, and one of, so it's not the way a current exhibit looks. So the teams are playing around with this now, and part of it is the content, but it's also the format. So that it's, it's more, it's the way we've gone with the transcript to make it um, easier to read and interpret. And so part of it is, as you say, the content and how much the level of detail, and, but then also the format. So one other thing that we're playing around with and trying to figure out, um, you know, just how we would do this are, are the reviewer comments, which get into more detail and more specifics about maybe why something was three credit hours, lower division, or you know, upper division five years ago, and now it's one credit hour, you know, lower division. So that there is some of the detail that you're talking about. So we're looking at, or that this represents, um, you know, they have this credit in IT because in order to complete this, they had to get a CompTIA certification. So it's that kind of detail that you're not gonna see in the general, that we're trying to build in just what like you're talking about. So I have like five or six different um, kind of paragraph comments that some of the, mili the military director, Michelle Spires and her team began to pull and put together from recent reviews. So to your point, it's a good one. And so we're trying to figure out how to speak to the general in a format that people understand and give some particulars that will address your, your concerns. So this is stuff we can, you know, use this um, group to throw things out and get feedback on just, you know, what works and doesn't work. So thank you for that question. Sure, thank you. And, and I, I like the format, by the way. I think you're definitely going the right direction. It's very easy to read. Yeah, yeah. As faculty evaluators, we do review the course syllabi, but this is how it's transferred after we review the information, but every course, we review actually does come with the course syllabus. I do have one question about, I, I, I've seen the exhibits that are currently out there on your site, and I noticed after, I'm the one that's setting up, I'm sorry, I'm from Penn State University, and since I'm the one who's setting up our rules in the system for what things are getting equated to and what we're giving credit for, I'm noticing, you know, I have five different students, and you know, student number one comes in with AR X, and then someone else comes in with MC this and MD that, and four or five different courses all have, you know, one credit hour of personnel supervision, another one has two credit hours of personnel supervision, or I have five, you know, five or six different occupational exhibits that all come in and, and involve technical math, one, one credit for here, two credits there, and I'm, I'm just looking at it and thinking, in the grand scheme of having our faculty review these, I'm curious if when you do the review, is there like a certain, I'm sure there's not a set list, but I mean, if you're looking at technical math and it's being given credit in a variety of courses, I can just give technical math, where 
our math department, they're reviewing one aspect instead of reviewing 20 courses that all have technical math in it. So if they could say that have, you know, we would give them credit for math 19001, and based on the ACE recommendations, we'd give them one credit hour for it or two credit hours for it. But you can use the course number 19001. We give you permission to do that. So every time I see a course come in that says technical math, I can give them math 19001 for one credit hour or two credit hours based on the ACE recommendation. And that condenses, you know, one, five, ten courses down to a, a lot less for our faculty review, and it doesn't look so overwhelming. And we might get a faster response out of our departments if we're able to do that. And so I'm curious if there's any kind of uniformity in the course titles that you use when you're giving credits. I mean, obviously, like you said, for some of the meteor courses or meteor, you know, in, you know, meteor content in occupations, there might be less common verbiage or, or titles that you're giving credit for, but is there any kind of maybe list of, oh, here, here's the list of all the ACE credit recommendations that exist, and then we could branch those out into, oh, look, AR 1900-0017 has, you know, personnel supervision or management. I, uh, let me just take a stab at this. I know we have just a minute it just coming to a close here, but uh, something that I heard today really, I, uh, Mary Beth's far more familiar with what's going on around the country. I'm so thrilled with what's going on in Ohio because I think that in Ohio is getting at much of what you're getting at. If, because this process is so variable across so many different services and so many different time, points in time, um, it just scatters in so many directions. Uh, anytime we can see patterns and analyze the patterns and come to alignment with particular curricula like the MTAG process. I think it's going to help everybody just create a consistency and set of patterns. I, I, I doubt that it will ever solve all of the problems, but if you can get, you know, if you can highlight segments of the curriculum that you see recurring over time, I think you can do just what you're getting at. And just really quickly, I think that's just a great question and there are different groups that are doing work with this. We use SIP codes obviously in setting up the teams and then doing the top, you know the topics and you can actually go on the guide and search by topic now which you couldn't do a while back which is great. Um, so you could actually search by some of the topics you're interested in but there are the Minnesota system is one system, SUNY Empire State is another where they are doing um, City Empire State is looking at the graduate level military and they're doing some they're doing some sorting that way but then Minnesota is doing a great job in looking across the service branches and looking at something like human resources and seeing where you know where where's the commonality where's the foundation how can we streamline this so I think part of you know part of our challenge is to get these efforts together so we're not all starting as if nobody's ever done this before and I really see this as a, as a role of ACE and groups like this to, to the, the multi-state consortium to, to come together because there is really good work being out there and we just need to shine a light on it. So thanks for asking that question. Part of my job is to uh, be the, the gatekeeper here. So uh, 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 ready to wrap up. Uh, I'm sure there may be more questions for our panelists. Uh, said that they would stick around in case you have uh, some more to, to ask. And please help me uh, thank them for their <laughs> thank all of you for your participation and supporting our veterans. Thank you.